can't help but to think about Mike Allen every time we sing that song. That was one of her favorite songs. And uh, she's with the Lord. What a, what a blessed, blessed woman she was and is. Well, <coughs> I'm a little uncomfortable in my skin this morning. I don't know if any of you noticed. I am underdressed. I am underdressed. I have got tennis shoes on. It was one of those father moments this week that caught, caught up to me this morning and bit me. Oh, my daughter was in my boots, stomping around. You know how little girls are, and she gets in her daddy's boots, and she was dancing all over our house in them. And it, it was just a cute moment until this morning I woke up and could only find one boot. <laughs> I knew if I woke that child up and asked her where it was, she wouldn't have the foggiest idea, so... I might be getting new boots this week. It is Father's Day, darn right. Got to tell that woman of mine, huh? <laughs> I got a deep fat fryer instead, so. <laughs> I'll just fill my boots a little better, <laughs> so. <laughs> new, new pants, new shirts to go along with those new boots. Yeah. Well, I hope you're having a fun weekend, and I hope you're doing something uh, enjoyable for yourself this uh, weekend, guys. And, but right now, we're down to the Lord's business, and uh, we're studying through the um, New Testament. That we're studying in particular the four Gospels, and I'm following a, uh, uh, a, a group of the Gospels done in such a way so that it kind of takes us chronologically as best as we can figure through the teachings of Jesus. And this morning, we are on uh, what I call parables of growth. And so we got a nice little thing there for you. We are in Mark chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 13. Um, these two particular um, parables have uh, just a little bit to do with each other because they're both about farming and, uh, and about harvest. And next week our uh, scriptures will be tied. Well, I'm sorry. Next week I'm going to be in Utah. My uh, mother and stepfather both turn 80. And uh, so the stepbrothers and I have got together. We're going to put a little thing together. So uh, Amy and the kids and I are going to be up there. And we have got a mystery speaker for you next Sunday. He's a mystery to us all. That's right. <laughs> so Scott Greenway is going to preach for us next weekend. And so I'm looking forward to listening to it. In fact, I might get on Facebook and watch you. Oh, no, we not. Oh, no, we not. In fact, we're going to put it up on two websites. So anyhow, um, so there's, that's kind of fun to watch, look forward to. So Sunday after next, we have two parallel verses from different uh, Gospels that we'll touch a little bit about uh, seeds. Well, this morning I want to talk a little bit about farming, introduce introduction of this, you know, uh, farming and, uh, and agriculture are a common kind of thread throughout Scripture. Uh, you know, you ha live in a culture that is um, ha heavenly dependent upon animals and uh, the soil. You're going to get illustrations um, constantly that bring up the farmer. And um, did you hear about the, uh, the farmer who lost control of his tractor out in his cow field? You didn't hear about that one? No? It's, you know, you might wonder if any of the cows got hurt, but uh, fortunately they didn't. He only grazed them. It is a Sunday for bad humor. <laughs> that same poor farmer had a summer visitor show up at his place and asked how long cows should be milked. And the poor farmer thought about it for a good long time. Finally, he replied, I reckon about the same time as the short cows. Yeah. Okay, so you want the gospel then. <laughs> We're going to go to Mark. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. Let's hear the word of God. <coughs> because it's about growth and harvest. Starting in verse 26, it says, He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. 
A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. This passage is a little awkward. People have a very hard time, theological experts and uh, Bible commentators have a hard time with this passage because of the way it works. Um, it's hard to say how it actually describes and who it describes uh, and the actions in it, uh, how they all work together because um, it seems a little mixed up. And I'll explain why. Who is the man who scatters seed in this parable? Who is the man who scatters seed in this parable? This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Now, many want to look at this and say this is about Jesus. Jesus is talking about himself. I'm in that camp, although I you know, when I look at it, I see the challenges with it. One of the challenges is, is that it goes on and says, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Though he does not know how doesn't fit my um, understanding of an omniscient God, Jesus being God. So what we can say in this is that sometimes language and stories have limits. It still speaks volumes about Jesus, but it has its limits. And sometimes we have to give stories some birth, some wide birth to understand them. The principle that I think that we see here, what Jesus is trying to say, is that he has come. This is the kingdom of God present with us. Jesus is here and he is pronouncing the good news. He is stating the word of God. And that word is now going out. And it's a mystery, at least at this point in history, to him, how that's going to completely work itself out. But he knows his purpose. He is here to do the will of he who has sent him, as he has said. And he is here to spread the word, the good news of the kingdom of God, that it has come and that it is here and it is going to take place and have its effect in this world. So... He spreads this. Night and day, whether he sleeps or he gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel on the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Now, what this does is it brings up several questions for us. Whether he gets up or sleeps, whether he gets up or sleeps. We can look at this in this way. Many people look around our world and ask, is God real? Is he active? Or is he something else? If he's real, then does he still work with us today? Is he still present with us? Does he act on behalf of his people? Or is he, as Thomas Jefferson and the deists believed, an uninterested God who created this and like an alarm clock wound it up, stuck it up on a shelf, and when it runs out, it's done. But he has really nothing more to do with it. Well, I believe in a God who is loving and caring. I believe that the scriptures also teach us that that is exactly who God is. And so when we talk about God being active in our world, I say absolutely, God is active. The God that I know through Jesus Christ, has said to us that he loves us, that he will be with us, even to the very end of the age. This God cares about us. There are times in our lives when we go through difficult times, when we wonder if God is there, but he is. Our faith shouldn't be shaken just because times get hard, just because we don't understand our circumstances. 
this God still loves us. It goes on to say that this seed grows. Well, how does it grow? There's an interesting passage in chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. It says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth or making it bud and flower, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This seed, wherever it is placed in this world, However it is distributed, wherever it lands, it will have a result. It will produce something. This seed, many of you know, struck your heart one day, this good news of Jesus Christ. And it took root here. And in your heart, by his spirit, your life is beginning to be changed and transformed into something that God can use. How much of it, how it gets quantified, is between you and him. In other parables, Jesus talks about that seed producing 160 or 30 times what was planted. God uses each one of us differently. But the one thing we know is that God's word never comes back to him void. It will be fulfilled. It will be useful to him. And then finally, and the point that I really kind of wanted to draw our attention to this morning, is that the harvest will come. There is a harvest, and it is going to come. This last week has been kind of odd in our history and in our country. We've seen some pretty difficult things. A man who decided because of his politics to go and attempt to target other people because of their politics and to destroy and maim their lives. And we think, how in the world does this happen? How does this happen here? Don't we believe in dialogue, debate, And when has it ever been okay for it to rise to the level of hurting and injuring others? Well, unfortunately, we were shocked this week by what we saw and heard. But it's not news, really. We've had people who've gotten upset over politics to this extent in the past. We've even fought a civil war over it. Men have been murdered because of their political point of view. Worse yet, men have been murdered and women over their religious point of view, the very foundation of our faith. People have argued to the point where they got so flummoxed that they actually hurt other people. In the name of Jesus. And I think that it's important for us to take a step back and calm the rhetoric. In this morning's hymn, Faith of Our Fathers, did you hear verse 4? Faith of our fathers we will love, both friend and foe in all our strife, and preach thee to as love knows how by kindly words and virtuous life. We have no right to take upon ourselves the judgment of others, even if we fully disagree with them, to the extent that we would harm them physically. When this happens in our communities, in our society, we need to be the first to stand and say, this is wrong. We need to pronounce judgment. And Christ tells us that we will judge angels. So it is okay to judge that which is wrong. But then the way we act on that needs to be, in some way, brought back about to the glory of God. 
harming another person, destroying their reputation, physically harming them, murder, is not where we can afford to go as Christians. Should we find ourselves in that place where we are so angry, so upset, so distraught that we would think in that venue we need to stop and put our hearts before the cross of Christ? It's important for us to represent him well in this world. Now, it's about struggles. Another parable that Jesus told, and we're going to pick up on this right now so we can flash up to Matthew and that passage there. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat. And went away. And the wheat sprouted and formed heads. Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then when, where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I, tell you that I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This passage is again about a farmer. Faithfully distributing the word in the world. And he knows, as Jesus brings about this, that the world is going to be divided. There are going to be those who respond to the word, and there are going to be those who are not part of the word. This passage is eschatological in nature, talking about the end days. But there are a couple of things we need to talk before we can get there. One is that there is a real enemy in this world. The enemy sows his word as well, the weeds. And he sows them in and amongst that which God has done. And the good word and the wheat that grows up will be accompanied by these weeds. We sometimes wonder why God would allow this. Why would God allow evil people to exist alongside of good people? I mean, why, why can't we just have a peaceful coalition of people? I hate that little bumper sticker, coexist, you know, with all the religious symbols on it. On one level, I can agree with it. We should be able to have civil dialogue with others. You're free to choose what you believe. That's one of the good things about our Christian faith is we have evolved over the years to believe that the scriptures teach us that it is by persuasion, verbal, intellectual, spiritual, that people truly become Christians. They do not become Christians because we dominate a physical area in which they live. The kingdom is made up of people who have made a choice to follow Jesus. There used to be a time in Christian history that we believed that you were a Christian because you were part of the empire of England or you were part of the country France or Spain or Italy. But the Christian church has evolved to realize that true Christianity and those who understand Christ have made a personal choice to accept them into, his, into their hearts and lives and let him transform them. Currently, we also have part of another religion that seems to suggest that <coughs> the world has to be dominated by them exclusively. And we wonder how God allows this to exist. 
Somehow in his wisdom, he knows that one day this will cease to exist. And that's what we look forward to. But until that time, we are left with the obligation of sharing the good news that has come into our lives. That part of us that is supposed to reproduce itself 160 and 30 times. That part of us that leaves behind a witness and a legacy that says, Christ changed my life, he can change yours. And that part of eschatology I want to talk about right now. Quite fr frankly, as a whole, I find eschatology a fool's errand. And the reason I do is because of these words from Jesus. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As in the days of Noah, it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men in a field, one will be taken and another left. Two women at the grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, the other one left. And then this word of warning. Jesus says, therefore keep watch because you do not know what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if that owner of the house had made known what time of night the thief was coming, he would not, or he would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This time when Jesus comes, he tells us that we have to be ready. We have to be prepared in the way that we live our lives. And there's two ways that we will go out of this world. One that most of us have known up until this point, and that is, is one day you grab your chest and you're gone. The other is that Jesus will come back for us. His harvest will take place, and he will take his faithful ones out of this world and leave behind that which is no good, the weeds, to be bundled and burnt. And sometimes we get uncomfortable with the idea of condemnation and hell. But it is a reality. It's the reality that I think is fully described throughout the scriptures. The reality is, is that we should be concerned for this world even as the Father was concerned. He desires that no one should perish, but that all might be saved. And that means that we have to be about the business of doing our best in this world and being fruitful for him. It's about bringing home the harvest. At the very tail end of this section of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 30, it says, At that time I will tell the harvesters, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The eschatology of Jesus, he uses a number of different illustrations to teach us. Weeds versus wheat, like we see this morning. The story of the wise virgins versus the foolish virgins. You might remember that story. The wise virgins had their lamps lit, wicked, full of oil, the foolish virgins didn't prepare their lamps, didn't buy enough oil. And so the night that the bridegroom is supposed to be coming, they realize that they don't have enough, so they had to run into town to get it. And while they were gone, the bridegroom came and took those women with him, and the other gals came back and missed out. And then there's a little section called the sheep versus the goats. To set this up, I want to remind you, last week we talked about this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. 
We are saved by grace through faith. But we are his handiwork to do good works. And so in this illustration, this eschatological illustration of the sheep and the goats, listen to this story and learn its lesson. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, this is Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory with all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. There's the great harvest. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats or as the farmer, the weeds from the wheat. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or, and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whenever you did this for the least of these my brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. We oftentimes hear these passages about being fruitful. And think that it's about going out on a street corner and preaching to people. About telling them about the good news of the gospel. I think that that is part of it. But I think that there's something else here. Something very important for us. It's about the way we love others. Remember the two great commissions that, or commandments that God gave, Christ gave us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to know where you are with God, ask him what you can do for someone else today. Ask him who needs that cold drink of water that you and only you can give in a way that's truly meaningful. Ask who you can feed. And it doesn't have to be a food bank. Many of you know Louise Marshall, who teaches our Sunday school here. She's just one of those souls here that just drifts in and drifts out. Easy to not notice. She's been gone for a couple, three weeks because she had a knee replacement. She could use a little extra hand, a call, a little bit of friendship. You know, Miss Connie has fallen for the third or fourth time now. Just a call to say, I love you, we miss you, we're praying for you. Maybe take her a meal. And then who in your life can you look around and say, Lord, who can I bless today? You know, this gospel is so worth the living and the loving. But it really takes root in our heart when we see saving souls from hell. It's about enriching souls for life. It's about giving of ourselves in such a way that others can see our good deeds and do what? 
glorify our Father in heaven. So I'm letting you off the hook. You don't have to get a soapbox. You don't have to get a big black King James Bible. And you don't have to go to a local corner and preach the gospel. Just live it. And you'll never have to worry about looking Jesus in the eye someday and saying, when didn't I be clothed? In other words, love your children. Preaching the gospel is done not only on a street corner. Sometimes it's just done with a bowl of soup. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you that scripture challenges us to remember that we are here for a purpose. Help us, Lord, not to just sit and enjoy our lives for the sake of of our own pleasure, but to really understand that our lives are here for a purpose and that the way we love others, especially those who call on the name of Jesus, reflects to this world that we love you and that you do make a difference in our lives, that you are not dead or silent, but that you are working through us. So, Lord, I pray this day that while we celebrate Father's Day and we ask for your blessing upon it, that you would take us this week and to go out and be harvesters in your field, men and women who love one another well, bless others, who do not let our anger grow beyond what's reasonable, and to give and extend our hand of help to any who need it for your glory and your praise. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and...